Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Take it away. Okay. Yeah. Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, as you can see, I'm going to be talking about maximum flow and min cost flow and all those linear time. This is joint work with several wonderful collaborators and uh, Lee, who's here from Georgia Tech. Yeah. Hey. He just happens to be here for like the next few quarters. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so, yeah. That's what we're doing. Okay. So, yeah. Um, let's get started. Uh, next slide. So, so yeah. Um, the slide portion of yeah, the slide portion of today's talk is probably going to be it's going to be about thirty minutes, and the two parts I'm going to cover are just like general problem history, our results, and intuition. And then I'm going to go a little bit into like a very high level algorithm, and then some intuition for why you should believe that each piece of the algorithm makes sense. So these are the two parts, and then after that, we're going to go into more details about every piece. So, yeah, let me start with the first part. Um, okay, can you just click forward a bunch? Just like, uh, click forward a bunch. Yeah, just because normally there's more, uh, more uh, oh, back, sorry. <laughs> yeah, 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 oh, yeah, maybe, yeah, yeah, maybe you can do it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Uh, back left, <laughs> Oh yeah. Okay, cool, so, um. Uh, yeah, let me just give a, refresher on what the maximum flow problem is, which is the focus of this talk. So in the maximum flow problem, you have a directed graph, G, which with vertices and edges. Generally, we say that there's M edges and N vertices, and there's integral capacities, which are at least zero. The goal of the max flow problem is to route as many units as we can between a source S and a single T. When we think of a flow, uh, we can think of it as an assignment of real numbers uh, to the edges of the graph satisfying a few properties. The main properties that we need to satisfy are the demand constraint. The demand constraint says that for every vertex that's not S and T, the amount of incoming flow and the amount of outgoing flow are equal, so that the net demand at every vertex other than S and T is zero. Additionally, we have to satisfy the capacity constraints, which says that the amount of flow with, uh, on an edge is between uh, the smallest, or well, like zero and its capacity U. And our goal is to maximize the total amount of flow between S and T, which we define as the amount of units leading S, which equals the amount of units entering T. So as for why we study max flows, the modern perspective I want to communicate is that flows are the easiest, or well, like flows are just like a general graph optimization problem. So in that context, we can think of a flow problem as the following. You want to route one unit between two vertices S and T while minimizing the total cost of the flow, where the cost of the flow is the sum over all edges of the cost of uh, the cost function on edge E of the amount of flow F on it. So we should think of cost E as general convex functions. So for different values of cost, or like different functions cost, it captures different problems. So, um, yeah, when cost is a linear function, this captures like linear programming on graphs, which is min cost flow, which captures max flow. Um, when cost is quadratic, so like cost E F E is F E squared, this corresponds to solving a graphical linear system called the Laplacian linear system. And for other things of other values of cost, like linear plus entropy, this starts capturing things like entropy regularized, OT, or matrix scaling. So our results actually capture basically this whole class of problems, not just max flows. We capture like min cost flow, uh, matrix scaling, like other norms, kind of anything that fits in this framework of sum over edges of a convex cost of the amount of flow on the edge. But for the purpose of this talk, we're just going to focus on max flow and min cost flow. Um, as for other direct applications of max flow, uh, bipartite matching is a natural one, as, as well as densest subgraph. There's been a lot of recent work on showing that various connectivity problems, like computing the Mori Hu trees, uh, can be reduced to some max flow calls in a black box manner. So we get improvements to those and negative weight shortest paths. So at this point, I just want to go through kind of uh, some of the results in the max flow um, literature to build intuition for where our ideas come from. So one of the earliest results in this, uh, yeah, click, yeah, is. Um, this work of uh, Galil Namad and Slater Tarkin, which gave an MN runtime for max flow. 
One way you can think of their runtime is that they have some number of iterations, something like n or m iterations. And every iteration, they can compute a flow or a sequence, like a set of blocking flows in linear time using some dynamic shortest path type data structures. Uh, the path-based um, work on max flow culminated in the work of Goldberg Rao in 98, which showed that you can compute uh, max flow in capacitated graphs. Oh, sorry, I guess I should have mentioned that um, in this talk, we're gonna think of the capacity as being polynomially bounded, something like you know, m to the 10, something like that. Our dependencies on capacities will generally be logarithmic. So, so uh, sorry, Goldberg Rao got an m to the m and m to the 1.5 runtime for max flow using ideas from blocking flows or shortest paths, that type of thing. So after that, there was no progress really. Um, and there was kind of a switch in the way Maxwell was approached. So in the work of Deitch and Spielman, they introduced the idea of using more continuous optimization methods or like more like explicitly continuous methods, like interior point methods for Maxwell. So in their work, they used the classical interior point method of Renegar or like, um, yeah, to show that you can do root M iterations of solving an L2 flow problem, which corresponds to like the Laplacian system that I mentioned. So that way they have root M iterations, every iteration is M time because they compute this electric flow. So the total runtime matches M to the 1.5. Since then, there's been several works that improve over this uh, idea of using interior point methods and Laplacians in various ways. So the work of Madri and um, some work of uh, KLS showed that you can reduce the number of iterations by uh, in undirected, in, sorry, uh, in uncapacitated graphs by calling, by like doing some stuff, but I'm not really gonna get into. So the goal of these, these two works was to reduce the iteration count beyond root M. Um, okay, cool. Um, so in the next works, uh, well, the LS also focused on reducing the iteration count to root N. So this is an improvement in dense graphs. More recently, there was some focus on developing faster algorithms for max flow by combining ideas from data structures along with these, uh, along with these uh, interior point methods. So you can think like the number of iterations hasn't actually gone down, it's still n for sparse graphs. However, we can implement each iteration possibly in sublinear time. So that's the way that these are times are um, So yeah, as you can see, like, uh, the iterations on sparse graphs is still root n or like root, square root n, but like the amortized time per iteration has gone sublinear, which is where the recent improvements come. Uh, however, all these previous works still use L2 based like electric flows for that type of primitive. So I guess to put it concisely, one of the main contributions of our work is that we actually allow the number of iterations of the algorithm to be linear. Like the number of iterations is huge, it's like L, and compared to these like square root n type iterations. However, the sub problems we encounter in every iteration are extremely simple compared to electric flows. And we're able to implement each iteration in almost uh, constant time. So the sub problems we encounter are precisely what we call the minimum ratio cycles instead of electric flow. So like these min ratio cycles are better in tune with graphs because they're based on paths and cycles, which are a nice graphical thing. Um, and they're undirected. So in that, and like, so that's some intuition for why we're able to get to the little over on time uh, and we're tied to compute there. On the next slide, I'll give some more intuition. So one thing that I've gotten a lot of questions about is that there was also a sequence of works um, several years ago on approximate max flows and the result they're able to show is we can get an m over epsilon approximate, uh, m over epsilon runtime for epsilon approximate max flows in undirected graphs, um, not directed graphs. So let me explain why this is natural. So, so maybe the main thing to convince you of is that epsilon approximate max flows in directed graphs implies high accuracy max flows in directed graphs. This is because if I can compute like say a one half approximate max flow in a directed graph, they, then they can just like take the residual graph and I've reduced the amount of flow by half. So actually when we talk about epsilon approximate max flows or like these results talked about them, it only makes sense to work in undirected graphs. So all our results you can think of as like 
a high accuracy for directed graphs. Yeah. Cool. So yeah, based on the previous slide, I just wanted to more clearly highlight the um, kind of like the difference between previous works, like the more classical works in Maxflow, more recent works, and then where ours come from. So classically, algorithms for flow problems were largely combinatorial. They were based on augmenting paths, shortest paths, blocking flows, like path and cycle based things. However, their main primitives uh, ended up working with like residual graphs, which are naturally directed from Maxflow. So basically every iteration, they do some path or cycle based thing on a directed graph. So the more recent work based on uh, continuous optimization kind of works with the observation that to solve directed maximum flow or to solve linear programs in general, it suffices to work with undirected problems where like the cost of using an edge in the forward or backwards direction is the same. This is like a key insight of continuous optimization in general. So in these works, they use electrical flows, which is some L2 primitive, which naturally comes from these interior point methods. And you can actually show that these allow square root M iterations of an undirected electrical flow problem to solve maximum. On the other hand, writing a flow requires a linear number of pads in most cases. Okay. So given this, the intuition for our, our algorithm is that um, paths and cycles are actually really great things to work with on graphs because they really capture the graphical properties. However, um, directed paths and cycles are very hard to reason about because like the directed edges are kind of unstable. So what we're able to show is that you can actually compute a maximum flow using a sequence of M, uh, M to the one plus little one, let's say, approximate min ratio cycles. The key point is that this is an undirected uh, flow problem instead of di a directed flow problem. So we're actually able to reason about it um, nicely using like, yeah, recent tools on undirected flows. So to put it a little more concretely, uh, one more claim. Yeah, to put it a little more concretely, um, these algorithms, you can think of like, each, they have like some number of outer iterations and some number of inner like calls to some graph problem. So in the combinatorial algorithms, they have some number of like, say like a linear number of outer iterations and the inner calls are to like minimum mean cycles, which you can think of, I have a directed graph and I want to minimize the ratio of the cost of the cycle divided by the length, like combinatorial length of the cycle. This is basically Goldberg Targen's very classical minimum mean cycle canceling algorithm. The continuous algorithms are working with this more linear algebraic problem they compute an undirected cycle or like basically undirected. And the objective they minimize is the gray sum gradient G dot the cycle divided by the length of the cycle in L2 norm. So here L is some diagonal matrix. So like every edge has a different cost. Um, so th that's like an electric flow problem basically. So the problems we study are, instead you turn the two norm to a one norm. It's the gradient dot the cycle divided by the length of the cycle under this um, like lengths L. And that's, yeah, is, if we can compute an approximate minimizer to that, then we show that that's enough to make progress towards computing a max flow. What's the relationship for G and L? Um, yeah, so G is some gradient of some potential function and L is like the square root of the Hessian or something like that. I'm gonna get into some details, but yeah. At a high level, that's what it is. And is there a direct connection to the first problem? The one uh, the no, not really. Well, yeah, not really. It, other than like the cost is like still a linear cost. And then the length is like the combinatorial length. So like it's like L equals one in some sense. Yeah. Like, so this is like a more linear, like nicely linear algebraic thing. Well, this is like more combinatorial. Yeah, if that makes sense. Okay. Cool. So yeah, in light of that discussion, uh, let me present kind of the main outer loop theorem. So the main outer loop theorem is that we can compute a max flow or a min cost flow in M to the one plus little o one iterations, um, where each iteration is the following. We add a circulation C to the, our current flow that we're maintaining, which is uh, almost constant approximation to being a minimizer of G dot C over LC one norm. This is some like minimum ratio cycle problem, uh, optimized over circulations and um, the gradient G and the lens L will dynamically change over the algorithm. 
Additionally, the coordinates of G and L, like those two vectors, will change at most m to the one plus little of one times during the whole course of the algorithm. So to implement such an algorithm efficiently, I guess I do have to describe how you would uh, add the cycle. Cause like the cycle could have, could like have several edges. So I do need to explain like how you actually add the cycle. So the way we're actually gonna add the cycle is the algorithm is going to maintain a spanning tree T and the cycle C will always be represented efficiently on the spanning tree. Uh, so the spanning tree uh, to get, so like the spanning tree T will change slowly over the course of the algorithm. And the cycle C, we're gonna represent it by saying, oh, here's a couple off tree edges. And then the cycle is going to be when you link up those off tree edges, uh, click, when you link up those off tree edges on the tree like this. So you would add that cycle to our current flow with, with some direction, like uh, th there's like a correct direction in that. But. So then, um, yeah, so T will change slowly during the algorithm and we're gonna add cycle C by representing it by these edges, add the cycle and implement these with like, Link cut tree or dynamic tree data structures, which is standard. So, so one edge is enough to create a cycle. So yeah. Adding multiple edges. Oh uh, yeah, it's a so like we can actually prove that for the tree we maintain there exists a single edge which is enough, but we don't know how to find it. The things we're able to find have like possibly many edges. Yeah. But it is true that the trees we maintain like there exists a single edge which would be good enough. We just don't know how to find it. So instead, there's m to the little o of one off tree edges. So it's worth noting that a simpler version of this theorem was actually shown in Wallacher and Zimmerman in 1992, which we found about after uh, the paper was released. What they show is that if you solve the problem exactly, then um, it suffices to make progress. So and solving the problem exactly is much more difficult than solving it approximately, which I think we'll see in a little bit. Okay, um, so given that, the natural thing is to design a dynamic data structure for maintaining the tree T and uh, finding the cycle C. So the informal version of the theorem is, we give a randomized data structure which supports the following operations. It maintains some gradient G and L on a graph, um, under changes to G and L and maintains this slowly changing tree T. And every time after G and L change, we can return a cycle C, which is an approximation to this uh, mid to a minimizer of G dot C over LC1 norm over all cycle C. And C is represented efficiently uh, given the tree. And the runtime is M to the little of one amortized and it works with high probability against oblivious adversaries. So let me explain a little bit what oblivious adversary means. Um, an oblivious adversary refers to a situation. An oblivious adversary refers to a situation where the inputs like the changes to G and L in the data structure don't depend on the outputs of the algorithm. So this is actually not enough for our purposes. Um, and because as we output cycle C, that actually influences how G and L change down the line. So like this theorem I say that is not enough because it's possible that like we output some C and that that causes like adversarial changes to G and L, which are harder to capture. So what we instead show is that we can adapt our data structure here a little bit to show that in the context of the updates to G and L given by the outer loop I described on the previous slide, that it still works. Um, so yeah, the possibly interesting thing about this is that kind of classically in the literature, what in the data structure literature, what people have done in the past is just try to prove that you can make the data structures work against generally adaptive adversaries. For example, when making them deterministic or things like that. We don't show that, we don't know how to show that. We instead just show that with a little bit of extra data given by the optimization method, like the data structure we designed for the oblivious adversary setting basically still works. And in this sense, we kind of go beyond this like standard oblivious versus adaptive data structure on the state. Okay. So yeah, at this point, I think it's a good time to stop for a couple of questions on the first uh, introduction part. Yeah. Yeah. So, what's what's the issue that you're dealing with? So the data structure is randomized, and what we're able to show is that if the data structure problem is just like imagine G and L change, and the 
how they change is oblivious to our outputs. Our data structure works for that setting. However, that's like not the setting you need to implement because, yeah. Um, okay. So we're able to show though that in the like the that the interior point method outer loop gives us a little bit of extra data about what the optimal solution to like this problem looks like, and it allows it allows us to prove that this data structure basically still works. But it's like not like it like it's strong like our data structure strongly does not work against adaptive adversaries. So then this allows making other kind of Yes. So is that some takeaway yeah, I think the takeaway is that when you have well, like my takeaway is that when you have optimization methods, they generally give you a little bit of extra data about what the optimal solution to each sub problem looks like. For example, in gradient descent, you always analyze it as like saying, if I went in a straight line towards op like the optimal solution, then that's like a good certificate. So we're using arguments like that to argue that it's still fine. Yeah. Uh, we don't have like a super general framework, but it wouldn't be surprised to extend it. Did anyone else have any general questions about these things? Okay, so maybe you mentioned this, but the, so this A44 directed or directed graph? Uh, directed, yes. It's any directed graphs, yeah. yeah. Main cost flow on arbitrary directed graphs. Yeah. So one slide where you was the third method was by a label by a directed, uh, anyway. I, oh, yeah, sorry. So, the algorithm works for directed max flow. However, the sub problems we solve at each iteration are undirected sub problems, which is, it's an interesting observation from general convex optimization that like things like this are possible. Yeah. But this is like, yeah, it's a, it's a kind of a funky intuition. Yeah. Okay, I guess we can keep going there. But yeah, feel free to interrupt with any questions. Okay. So um, maybe let me just state like a general algorithm outline again, um, so we can have a good idea of where we're going. So the general algorithm would look something like the following. We start with the graph G with some capacities. And let's say we have some initial flow F0. So we're gonna go for M to the one plus little o one iterations. In each iteration, we're going to maintain a spanning tree T using some data structure. So at every iteration, we're going to update the gradients and lengths, and the gradient and length at uh, iteration t are gt and lt, which are real vectors. We're going to change the tree t according to these new gradients and lengths in some way. Like the data structure is going to do that. The t, tree t will change by a few edges only, like m to the little o of one edges per iteration. Now we're going to call the data structure one more time to find the cycle that's efficiently represented on the tree t with a couple of odd tree edges and approximately minimizes that ratio over all cycle C. And then we're going to scale C properly and then add C to F. So that's like kind of the general algorithm structure. So the main questions here are then, how do we actually define this gradient G and these lengths L? And how do we actually, you know, um, yeah, how do we define G and L? And how do we like actually, you know, find the cycle C and maintain the tree T? So I'm going to talk about these points naturally, like that's kind of the goal of the record. So yeah, maybe you've done this before, but when you add, uh, usually you think of adding parts or yeah. augmenting parts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what does it mean to add a cycle? Oh, yeah. uh, good, yeah, good question. Um, I'm thinking more in the context of minimum cost flows. Okay. Yeah, let's think of the context of like minimum cost flows, where you want to route exactly one unit between S and T, or like uh, route some fixed amount between S and T, satisfying the capacities and minimizing the cost. So in that sense, every time I'm going to like add a cycle to the flow to change it. Yeah. Okay, nice. But the same with the analogy when you adapt it. Yeah, to adapt the analogy to pads, you can think of like, imagine there's like a large, you know, uh, imagine that there's a large backwards edge between like T and S. And then when I add a path, I also will add some equal amount of back flow on the T to S edge. So that in that sense, you're adding a cycle. Uh, did you have something? Okay. So yeah, those are the two main questions that we have to cover. So I'm going to start with this one, and then I'll give a little bit of introduction to that one. Second one's important. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. In the development of all these yeah. macro algorithms, are there points in the history that sort of are precursors to some of the steps in the uh, specific algorithm? Or 
Um, Go to the departure. So. Yeah, I think the main departure is this like willingness to use L1 problems. Yep. That's the main departure. Um, the intuition for the data structure design is fairly heavily influenced by uh, like um, previous work on like understanding routings and tree embeddings. And the, the proof of this very closely follows like the classical interior point methods. So, yeah. Wait, I have, a, I have a very stupid question. Yeah, that's fine. Um, yeah. So like the inner product between G and C is like, you know, some G, I, C, I. Yes. Isn't the L1, norm? so big L is a diagonal matrix, right? Yes, diagonal matrix. So isn't L1 norm of LC also just some L, I, C, I? Like yeah. Like a different notation for the numerator and denominator. Um, is so the things in the denominator can be negative and you can take absolute values? Yeah, so like, so like, yeah, that, that's a great question. So in the numerator, when, when like I have flow forward or backwards on an edge, it has opposite costs. Oh, oh because okay. it's, so, yeah, yeah. Gotcha, gotcha, yeah, that, that values in C can be negative. Yeah, C can be negative and it depends on the direction while the denominator is always gonna be positive. Gotcha, okay. So like, it's not that the flow is constant along these cycles you're adding. No, 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 the flow is constant, except like depending on the direction I use an edge E, it's oh. total, it's contribution to the numerator can be positive or negative. Gotcha. Okay, yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, great question. Great question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But that's the difference between uh, the numerator. That's what it's really Gotcha. Okay, um, so yeah, let me just maybe explain some intuition behind. There was one more question. Oh, yeah, sorry, was there another question? Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, I, I'm going to talk about that right now. Yeah, great question. Great question. Um, so, yeah, so let me just talk about the potential, like the interior point method we do, which is very high level based on a lot of in, like previous works on interior point methods. I think like all the analysis is kind of known before, like in some sense, but I think it's a conceptual thing to try to prove that you can do it with all works. The analysis is very simple. Anyways, so the general setup uh, here, well, I'm going to go into more detail after the slides part, so let's not worry too much, is that you have a potential, which is 20m times log of, I'm going to write f minus f e star. So you, the way you should think of this term is just, it's how far I am from routing the max flow. So like f minus f e star is like how far I am from like the maximum flow f. And the second term log of u e minus f e plus log f e is how close I am to each of my capacity constraints. So like the log F term is the uh, ca uh, the capacity constraint that the flow is positive. And the first term is the constraint that the flow is the most unique. So um, the idea behind this objective, which was introduced in Karma Carp uh, in the eighties, the intuition is that it trades off routing more flow. So getting closer towards the max flow F and staying away from the capacity. So this is the log barrier um, term. So the idea behind a potential reduction in tier point method as introduced in Carmel Car is that we want to reduce the potential by an almost constant amount each iteration so that when the potential is at most O of, ne like negative O of M log M, then my error is polynomially small. You can show that the second term is bounded like by m log m. So if the first term is negative, so that so the yeah, so if the total potential is m log m, then the first term is uh, very small. Yeah. So given this potential, remember our goal is to decrease the potential each iteration. Then the definition of the gradients and lengths actually is very natural. The gradient is just the gradient of this potential, um, and the lengths are the square root of the Hessian of this second part. Um, so it's one over UE minus FE plus one over FE. So remember that we actually don't care about approximation. So it's not too important that like, basically there's actually some flexibility in how you define the gradients and lengths because we don't care about approximations. Like we're willing to lose approximations. But that's the intuition for where these come from. You have this potential function and the gradients are the gradient of the potential function and the lengths are, uh, they depend on the second part. Like, think of it as like the derivative of log is one over that. So like morally, this is somehow like taking new steps, right? It's like somehow yes. taking steps in the direction of Hessian inverse yes. gradient. Yes. But like here you take the L1 norm of the Hessian. Yeah, the analysis is still based on L2. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. It's still based on L2, yeah. But yeah, it's, it's a Newton step, basically. That's what an interior point method is. It's like a local Newton step. Basically. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Good question. Yeah. 
Then the algorithm is basically going to update f to f plus c, where c approximately minimizes this gradient dot c over. You can show that this reduces the potential by m to the minus little over one per iteration, which I'm going to cover right after the slides. And if f stars, uh, and another important point, which is related to this thing about adaptive versus oblivious adversaries, is that to show that like this potential, like this ratio can be very small, you, you can show that if f star is actually the true max for a true min cost flow, then if I had chosen C to be f star minus f, then that would have been a good solution. Like I couldn't output that and that would be a good progress step. I'm gonna try to go over these points in a little more detail, so I'm kind of going through this. Okay, wait, sorry, can I just ask what, the, what that last point means? Like, obviously if I step in the direction of the true solution, that's good. You're saying that that is compatible with this notion of good? Yes, that stepping in the true direction and then divided by M will decrease the potential. Got it. By, okay. by like, by the amount we desire, yeah. So, so like, like the potential is not leading us astray. Yes, yeah, if you, okay. like at every, at any point I am, if I step towards F star, like by a small amount, then the potential will go down. Perfect, okay. Yeah, so like that, that's an important point that is useful for later. Okay, so uh, at this point, I'm going to briefly cover why we should believe that this min ratio problem is like potentially kind of simple or like there's hope to get a fast algorithm for it. So um, as a warm up, let me just explain how to return a cycle C, which approximately minimizes this ratio in um, nearly linear time O of M. So remember our ultimate goal is to get amortized M to the little O of one under G and L slowly changing. But the goal of this is I'm just gonna present a very, very simple um, nearly linear time algorithm for this problem. And hopefully that'll, uh, give us some hope that you can make it uh, almost constant amortized. So the algorithm is that we're just going to sample a random tree T. Uh, the definition of random, let's not, I'm gonna explain later. So to say, when you sample the random tree T, then I'm going to look over all fundamental cycles of an edge E. The fundamental cycle of the edge E is I take E and then I take the path of the tree that links it up and that's a cycle. And I'm going to check all of those and like check that ratio. I'm going to repeat O of log n times and take the best I found. Okay. Wait, so here edge E is not in the tree T. Edge E is not in the tree, yeah. I'm going to check E plus the, plus the path and I'm just going to like check all those cycles. Sure. Okay. So yeah, the notion of random we need is that the expected length of the fundamental cycle of edge E is a poly log factor longer than the length of edge E. Um, so, on, yeah, on average, the fundamental cycle is only a polylog factor larger. Uh, you can show that you can um, sample from such a distribution in um, O tilde M time. And yeah, that's the notion of random tree. This is, yeah. Okay. So to, now it's like useful to understand why this could possibly work. And let me try to explain the intuition for why this works. So let C star be the optimal minimizer of this ratio, okay? So the idea is I'm going to look at C star at every edge and I'm going to embed a C star into the tree. So like I have this optimal solution C star and then I'm going to like take C star, I'm going to route it into the tree. I'm going to decompose it as the sum of these cycles. And I'm going to make two key claims. The first claim is that the length when I routed into the tree T hasn't gone up by too much. Formally, the ex expectation over this random sample of the sum overall edges of its optimal um, amount times its length of the cycle when I route it into T hasn't gone up by too much. And that follows by like the random tree condition. Okay, so now we sampled log entries. So with high probability, we have that the, this like, um, the, like the length of routing C star into the tree is only a polylog factor larger. It happens with high probability for some tree because we sampled uh, log entries. So now let me claim that one of these cycles CT now is an O tilde one approximate solution. The proof has two pieces again. The first piece is to uh, prove that the total gradient over all these cycles is actually equal to the total gradient of C or C star. Um, and the total length is at most um, the length of C. So to see this, let's, um, let's look at the following diagram. So, uh, we have this, uh, we have a tree and we have this cycle C star consisting of three edges. So now we're going to like decompose C star as a sum of three cycles. 
this blue cycle, this purple cycle, and that uh, last green cycle. So notice that for every edge in the tree T, there's exactly one instance where the edge is forwards and one instance where it's backwards. So in that sense, the gradients, when I sum over all these three cycles, every gradient on the tree is going to cancel out exactly. So the total gradient of C and the sum of gradients of uh, CTs, like the fundamental cycles, is the same. Additionally, the total length of the fundamental cycles has only gone up by an O tilde one factor. Therefore, by an averaging argument, one of these has quality um, at most O tilde one that of C. Okay, maybe let's stay on this slide because I think that's the last one. Um, so yeah, let me take a couple questions about this argument. Yeah. So maybe I'll find out argument a little bit more about this. So the dynamic setting, don't you also need the cycles to be short? Um, right, yeah. So it's going to affect the gradient of the length of the gradient. Um, yes. Uh, uh, actually, sorry, could you elaborate a little bit on why they would need to be short to affect them later? So say you have a ten degree update time algorithm. Say yes. You want to see your argument overall the end iterations, the number of changes to, to that data structure are yes. for the end, right? Yeah. So I mean, we should, does that not uh, translate to effectively find the grabbing along short path? Does that ah. affect the flow? Oh, okay, okay, okay. Good question. Good question. Um so the reason that's okay is that um you can show that regardless of how long the cycles are, the number of of times the lengths will change by a factor of two is at most O of M. This, it's independent of how long the cycles are. Yeah, and gradients, you can, you can show some similar sort of stability bound. Yeah, and that's independent of how long the cycles are, like combinatorially. So uh, you're no, sample the tree and then look at all the edges. Yeah. yeah. Now create the fundamental cycle, which is what the edge to the tree and see what cycle is. Yeah. Okay. And you're saying in all of these trees that you've done for yeah. one of them is going to run short. Short enough, but good enough ratio. Not enough ratio. Yeah. I sample log in trees with this like expectation that the lengths are most polylog larger. And I check all the fundamental cycles, and one of them has good enough ratio up to polylog factors. A gradient dot cycle divided by length of cycle. Yeah, there's underlying length and gradients in every point. Okay. And so on the last slide, you gave like this criterion of what you want the distribution of yes. uh, over trees to satisfy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I guess later you're going to show us why it's possible to sample. Uh, trees this way. That's standard. I'm not going to. No, not standard. It's oh, like okay, a, it's sure. well known in like the tree embedding literature. So I'm just probably not going to cover it. Got it. Sure. Yeah, it's okay. called like we'll low stretch trees or like expected low stretch trees is the key word. What are the lengths that the tree embedding is going to be using? Uh, like the like the underlying lengths on the graph. And the gradients are different. The gradients are unrelated to the construction of the trees. Yes. The gradients are actually completely unrelated to the construction of the trees. You only care about the lengths. Yeah, we see the trees. So you just need the trees to be expected to low stretch yeah, yeah. with respect to the underlying yeah. length scheme, and the gradients don't matter. But the gradients are coming in, you know. Uh, I think the, yes. the, the, the point, the uh, sum of the density is equal to the gradient. Is that right? Is that... Um, no, no uh, okay, sorry. I um, think the next slide was like sum of the, the length of the cycle is equal to two T times three. Uh, uh, give me a second. Yeah. Um, okay, so yeah, the gradient comes into how C star is constructed. Yeah, and it also comes into the cycle you return because you return the, the fundamental cycle with the best ratio of G dot C over LC. Like you like, evaluate this objective for every single fundamental cycle and take the best one. So like it comes in there, but in the random construction of the trees, it does not come in. And you don't need to use anything about the relationship over here. No, 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 nothing. Yeah. Yeah. In this construction. And it the, the it works because over the fundamental cycles, the gradient cancels exactly because it's a linear term. And like when I route fundamental cycles into trees, then like the tree has no flow on it basically. So that's the only probability that you can just create that they're cancel. That they're linear, yeah. That's the only problem. Yeah, they're linear. 
Okay, great. Um, yeah, maybe I think it's a good time to take like a maybe short break while I maybe think of um, what I'm going to talk about up next, for like the next half an hour ish. Okay. Okay. Sure. Maybe we can be in what five, ten minutes. Yeah, I'll do five minutes. Yeah. Okay. And then we'll probably just yeah. And then we'll Yes, 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 yes. And obviously, I'm happy to take questions within those five minutes. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, feel free to ask questions. Yeah. Wait, so wait, let me just make sure I understand the big picture. Also. Right. So, okay, using this technique, we can approximately minimize ratio of gradient to length yep. given G and L. Yep. Now, G and L aren't part of the like the specification of the problem, right? So yeah. like you're going to pick a sequence of G's and L's yes. such that solving this problem and adding up all the cycles gives you a Yes, and G's and L's are given with by this like interior point method. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Oh wait, hold on, wait, wait, wait. I'm not sure I understand that. So like where do the G's and L's come from? So like they're like like you know like in a uh, general optimization method, right? I have yeah. like some function I want to minimize. Certainly. And yeah. every iteration I'm going to minimize some like some something like you know I'm gonna minimize like a linear approximation of that or something like that. Got it. Yeah, yeah. So like you should think of like I'm gonna minimize this potential function, which is okay. which when I reduce it will give me a max flow. And every iteration, the thing I minimize is like some approximation of the potential like decrease, which ends up being like some Newton step. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um. But is G gonna be like literally the gradient of, the sum is, of cost? Yes. Uh. G is literally the gradient of the potential function. Let me go back. Got it. Okay. okay. Yeah, G is literally the gradient of like the uh, log variable potential function. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Okay. And then L. Is L is like, like it's like some version of the Hessian. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah, L is like some version of the yeah, like it's, it's a, yeah, like that. G is literally the gradient. L is some version of the Hessian. Yeah. Perfect. And okay. we, remember that we don't care if like things are actually very approximate. Like things can be edged a little over the We don't care. So yeah. L we're very flexible with. Okay. And G you can show some similar type of like. Uh, Flexibility. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let me just go go like the, to the full slide. Okay. Yeah, it's like oh, uh, what's up? Uh, yeah, min cost. You would just do like, yeah, like an F minus C transpose, like 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 cost like cost of F. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, still a log barrier. Yeah. I think F F one. Is that the what's the statement this slide? Uh, so F is the F is the maximum flow, and this term represents the, um, the, the current flow that's being routed. The, the current flow on, uh, on the edge E backwards, which is the total flow that's being routed currently. Like this term is current flow, this term is max flow. On, on a, this, this is oh, a guess value FE star is like the current flow. Yeah, FE star is the current. So, so think about this way. Like, what I'm doing is I have a graph G, right? Mm -hmm. Um and I and I'm gonna create a fake back edge which I call E star from T to S. And I'm okay. instead going to route oh, a circulation. Okay. Okay. And I'm gonna route a circulation. Yeah. So then the amount of flow on the back edge is the forward flow. Because and F is the total max. Uh, yeah. And what are U E and F E? Um so F E is current flow. Current flow on edge U E is upper capacity. Yeah. Oh the capacity. Yeah, U E is the upper capacity. Yeah. It's, oh, what's U E U and C? Oh, uh, so where is that? C of cost. Oh, well, C is a cost or something. No, C is a cycle. Cycle. Cycle, uh, cycle C, okay. which approximately minimizes that ratio. Okay. okay. Yeah, and then you scale it properly. Yeah, there's always some scaling you have to apply. Yeah. 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 Um, approximately minimizes this. Yeah. Um. And the property of the log entries you need is that like one of them, if we, if you go forward, um. So like, so I'll go back a slide. So like, this is the expectation that like when I route C star into the tree, that the expected total length is O tilde. That's my Markov plus this property. That's this property plus Markov. So if I sample log entries, if I lose an extra factor of two then one of the trees will satisfy this without the ex expected value with high probability. Yeah, and, that's, and you just need that, and then get, that tree will be good enough as a, that tree will support a good fundamental cycle. Yeah. I, I want to make a suggestion. Maybe, maybe before you start, uh, maybe uh, have someone maybe at this point, where someone, someone like a, uh, just a, a page yeah. orientation. And, and okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, I think probably I'll start there, but yeah, maybe I'll keep a table of notation. 
in this order. Or I guess, right. Sure. So UE equals capacity. Okay. Um, let me use. I'm going to switch to doing min cost flow. So let me let Z equal edge cost for min cost flow. Um, F -E. Z -E. Uh, yeah, Z -E. yes, yes, yes. Edge costs, yeah. F -E. oh, so for each E, Z -E is a function of uh, no, no, just like a real number. Yeah. Min, min cost flow. So, it's got it. Right. So the total Sorry. cost is going to be transpose that. It's going to be like the total cost. F -E sure. is the current flow. Oh, current. F equals like the op value. So it's uh, F equals the min. Of Z transpose F over, uh, you know, like flows F satisfies the mm -hmm. problem. Okay. Uh, I don't know what other notation. So phi of F is going to be the potential. Are you going to write out the potential? Yeah, I'm going to write out the potential again. Yeah. Uh, oh, should I write it here? Yeah. Okay. okay. So um, I'm going to do 20M log Z transpose F minus F uh, minus sum over edge of Log is minus F plus log F. Oh, this is every test have positive effects. This is like this is Got it. Okay. Um, and then why the factor of 20? Can I replace it with 30 and it would still work? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay. 20 is arbitrarily large enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It just has to be like larger than like three or something. But... Got it. Sure. <laughs> Works for me. Yeah, yeah. It's a little nicer to use 20 because then we can be lazier with the approximation factors. And then C is always going to denote a cycle. And you have to uh, Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. A G and L are. Uh, so G is the gradient of the potential. And L is going to be one over UE minus FE plus one over FE, which is like the second derivative of this part. Well, square root of that. Got it. Okay. Now, wait a second. So when you're solving this problem, you don't know big F yet, right? We don't know big F, but um, as so then yeah. how do you compute the gradients? Uh, you can just search for this binary search for yeah. basically. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. You can basically just binary search for big F. Sure. Okay. Uh, is the matrix? Uh, yeah, L E is this. Sorry, and then I'm going to be lazy sometimes and just write L to be diagonal matrix of L. And G is the. So that's the general notation setup. <laughs> Moses, you're going to part everyone. This is the vision for why is this essential. Uh, so I, I, I see you sort of on a. Yeah, this is like the standard thing that. Oh, you're going to do like the. Uh, this is the chair for that. Yeah. Okay. I mean, the intuition is just like there's some, you want to trade, trade off somehow between like not saturating capacities too much and like yeah. getting a better solution than this. Like the law function is nice. Yeah, yeah, the, the 20 is not going to change. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it doesn't really come up that many places. So we're going to find a small bug in 30 minutes and then it's going to be 40. No, 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 no
is negative kappa, and let's say kappa is m to the minus little o. Um, and let's say that g transpose c also is like negative kappa squared over 50. You can always scale c so that like this is scale invariant, so you can always scale it so that this property is true. So the main claim to show is that phi of f plus c is at most phi of f um, minus like omega of kappa squared, and then that that's sufficient. Like that's what we want to show. And the uh, a couple other things is that uh you technically don't need to use the real g and the real l like um so it's fine to use instead some like g tilde and l tilde satisfying l tilde is approximately l within a factor of two on all edges and the condition on g you need is that the infinity norm of l inverse g minus g tilde is at a most like some epsilon and you can and like those g tilde and l tilde are valid and um I'm just not really going to talk about that, but in, but like that's how you show that things change slowly every iteration. Uh, like the number of times L will change by a factor of two um, is bounded by O of M. You can show that, and the number of times G will change in this norm by epsilon is also like uh, a total of M times. So that's what I said. Okay. So yeah, uh, this is the main claim. I'm just going to like sketch a proof of this. Um, because I do, I do want to get into the data structure part. So maybe let me just sketch these like reasonably quickly. So the high level idea behind how you show this is just, well, it's just a Taylor expansion basically. So like if you Taylor expand phi, you know something like phi of this, right? We're going to be at most. Yeah. It's like your <laughs> So if you Taylor expand, you're basically going to get something like this. Right. Um, you're going to get that is at most that term minus the gradient, like the gradient dot what I'm adding, plus um, then you're going to end up getting something like the, um, you know, like C transpose O of, uh, o of this times the Hessian times C, something like that. This is like the L2 Taylor expansion term. Okay. Um, so let's think about what the Hessian of this term is. So there's two parts. Um, let me not, let me just kind of throw out the first part of the Hessian. So like the, the 20M log, I'm just gonna throw that out. That is actually not important. So like this is approximately the Hessian of the second part, which is one over E minus F E squared plus one over F E squared. Okay. So this thing, wait, that should not edge. So then, this, if you keep going, is at most that minus the gradient plus um, the norm of C. Well, it's going to be at most, uh, let me write this is at most L E squared, right? This is going to be at most the L2 norm of C. C E transpose C is that given. Um, and then we actually just bound this by the one norm. So now remember, this is kappa squared over 50. And then this term, remember that the ratio is kappa, right? So um, this is going to be like kappa over 50 squared, uh, big O, I'm not going to write that, which is then most that minus omega. Yeah. Yeah. When you write, try to think of the gamma. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, I'll try. So um, at a high level, that's just like the silo analysis for why if there exists a C with good ratio and we scale it properly, then we potentially will go down. So there's, there's a, a question. Yeah. Uh, on where? From Kevin. Oh, what is the question? Can you just read it? Yeah. Kevin, uh, you said that the ratio is the final thing. Is yeah. one over A plus one over B and the Hessian is one over A square plus one over B square. I'm just checking that L is not sort Hessian in general. 
the square root of that. Um, it doesn't matter because it's up to a, we don't care up to a factor of two. So like we're we're willing to lose constant factors kind of everywhere in here. So we don't care if like um yeah we're willing to lose constant factors everywhere. So it doesn't matter if it's L or like the square root which are equivalent of the factor. Okay, that's okay. Cool. Yeah, why is it obvious that the so you're saying kappa zero 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 one? Yeah, yeah. After the negative why is off the why is off the constant? Um, right, you're saying it was like an infinite more than one approximation. Um, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so yeah, so you're asking why this is like achievable. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I was gonna talk about that. Okay. So now, um, so now I think we understand now why, if we're able to find a cycle C with that good ratio, that is good. So the main claim I want to make now is that G transpose. Uh, now let F star equal the optimum flow. Optimum flow uh, as an invader, as in like Z transpose F star equals capital F, let's say. Then I'm going to prove that G transpose, um, or like basically what you're able to show, I, I don't know if I, if I want to actually show this, but you're basically able to show this is at most, um, yeah, at most like negative one tenth or something. That's basically what you're able to show. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm deciding whether I want to actually prove this for the sake of time. Like maybe let me just like omit this for the sake of time, but it's like another kind of like standard kind of thing. It's like it's just a calculation. It's it's kind of just a calculation, like there's not there's not anything special going on. But that's the intuition. So like I can prove that when I do one iteration with a good certificate, it, the flow the amount goes down. And um the optimum value of that ratio is at most negative a constant because you could have taken C to equal F star minus F. And F star minus F is circulation with the cost of C. Okay, cool. So, um, yeah, okay. Maybe let me just leave this part of here and let me take over because he was going to talk about the, um, how you actually construct data structures. Sorry, what was your, yeah. What's the, you said there was an intuition here. What's the intuition? I mean, I just see like all the like, people. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, like, I mean, it's a, like, this is an optimization method, right? So yeah. in general, in an optimization method, like if you move towards the optimal solution, it's a, it's like good. So this is just like a formalized, formalizing that you, the formal way you can do this. But like, you do have to kind of check it by hand. It doesn't end up being. So like the intuition is like, if the direction I want to move it is towards F star, then my potential should go down. And this is just saying that's true. Does it make sense? Can you compare a bit to what was done before with the L2 optimization problem? Or yeah, so the L2 ones are like primal dual. They're not like potential function based. Uh, they need to like, yeah, they're primal dual. Like there's a primal variable and a dual variable that have like have some relationship. So it's a, a little different. This is how it's like, this is how like it was done in like the 80s before they figured out primal dual like effects. But we end up writing it this way because it's more. It's like more flexible and you can lose like huge approximation factors and it doesn't affect the success of the algorithm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to understand why I didn't have spots because you came in with that from going with the L1 instead of the L2. Yes. So it's part of that is going to be a little bit of engineering of the data structure. Right? Yes. So is there any right here where you're putting a big advantage as well? Um, yeah, one big advantage is that like you can afford to use very crude approximate solutions. So like, like you you can like solve this problem up to a factor of like m to the my m to, m to the little o of one. That's like fine. Like, yeah, that's completely fine. Um, well, it's a little harder to see that in the other side. So that's one thing you gain. Additionally, the number of iterations here isn't like that bad. It's just like m, which is what you expect. So. Um, Okay, do you want to take it away? Yeah, sure. Okay, okay. One, one extra question. Yeah, of so how is this? Uh, do, you, do you see any parallels between the work of uh, Bernstein and company for uh, the shortest uh, negative, uh, negative weight shortest path? I guess that's combinatorial. Is there Ooh. any way to interpret part of what we're doing in that terminology or? Yeah, okay, so the context is, um, Independent, uh, like independently, simultaneously with this paper, um, 
Bernstein uh, and some other authors gave uh, almost the initial algorithm for negative weight shortest path. Um, but that's also evident in multiple single level one. Um, so, in terms of parallels, I don't see any direct parallel here. It seems that what they're doing is calling like Dijkstra in like the right nice way or something. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know. It's a good question. Okay, so um, my turn. Okay, so I'm Li Chen, I'm from Georgia Tech, and so, so I happen to be here. So I'm talking about the data structure for this mean ratio problem, mean ratio cycle problem. Okay. Uh, and this, I'll, I'll try to write on this side of the board, if that's fine with you. Okay. Yeah, so before start, I would like to address some kind of some funny, some fun fact about this algorithm. So see, we have this endless mode of one over there. So what's, what's the exact? It's actually exponential to the log two is seven over eight. And can you have it up for Oh, yeah, sure. Should we have it up? Yeah, I'm not the one here. So this is actually exponential to the log to the seven over eight of m the number of edges times log log. So yeah, this is what we are doing here. So if this doesn't feel comfortable to you, so I, yeah, I cannot help you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, this is actually uh, is smaller than any like zero point zero one. Maybe maybe a note. So like the intuition for where that comes from is if I have a recursion where the next layer of recursion has a factor of two more edges than the yeah. previous layer of recursion, then you naturally get this type of thing. Because I can't afford log n layers, so the number of layers has to be between like one and log n, so like square root log n type thing. Number of layers of the so, uh, so back to our data structure problem. So we want to design a data structure for this problem. Let me just write it again here. We want to find a cycle C that uh, minimizes some the dot product of this gradient term g dot c, or it's like just the sum of gradient turns over this cycle that respects it, that respects this orientation of edges. And then I want to minimize the ratio. So what's happened in the denominator is the L1 max of this cycle. Does this look clear to you guys? Or? So, and I want to support like two operations because we are talking about the last one. Operation one, I want to update some edge of its uh, gradient or its length, G sub E or L sub E. And then for after the updates, I want to support uh, some query. I want to query, for a um, n to the small of one approx solution to this, let me call this problem stop to, to this uh, star. Is this R? So, yeah, so this is our data structure problem. And uh, okay, so I had some more questions. Yeah, good. Oh, yeah, yeah, nice, nice. Thank you. Yeah, this looks super nice. Thanks. Okay. So, yeah, this is our data structure setup, and we want to solve this problem. And one, this, the time for this data structure is like we want uh, end to the of one query time and update time. 
So I will just write n to a small one part. Okay. Here's the setup. And uh, let me, I, I, don't, I don't really want to erase this up. So I'll move back here. Yeah, or you, oh. maybe, you can also think about going with your I'm not sure. I yeah. guess that that's quite quite a bit. Like, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, maybe we just, yeah, just, just yeah. Right. We can, we can I, do that. That's fine. We, you want to use that? Uh, okay. I guess we don't need it. We don't need it for now. We don't need it for now. Yeah, I don't think we do. Yeah, this is the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't need it. So maybe it's also good to write a little bit smaller. Uh, I, have, I have a sense that there's a lot. Of yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I tend to write like much bigger and getting smaller all the time. And <laughs> it just converts to a perfect size. <laughs> Okay, so now uh, Young just Young has mentioned a, a potential solution, like a potential solution that based on like the random sampling trees. So I want to uh, do a fast recap. Recap, and it is how do we solve this problem approximately? There is the way is that given a graph G, I want to sample like sample a tree from some distribution d such that such that for any edge it's this distribution satisfies the following condition that for every edge the stretch of this edge e is totally long so all the heck is this stretch so it's so given given a tree so we have this uh, edge E that connects vertex U and B. The stretch is defined as the uh, length of the unique tree path connecting U and B. Okay. So that's the definition. I guess I don't have to write it now. I guess you guys can remember it. So I'll just erase this. So yeah, no, 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 it's fine. Yeah, okay, stretch. So given this stretch, so we have this condition that means, okay, with probability more than half, uh, suppose I have the, the, um, the stretch has LE has this C D star, where this C is the optimal solution to this problem, to the star problem. This term is, at most, polylog times its L1 length. And this is why, this is how the approximation ratio comes from. And this is why uh, we can solve the problem on this tree without losing too much. So, yeah, so, so the problem is, uh, we don't have a good data structure to maintain this distribution and maintain all these trees. So, so I'll just present another another uh, another kind of approximation algorithm for this problem. A bit. Uh, so let me present you how should what's the right way to approximate this problem. Uh, so I will present like two two types of approximation problem algorithm for this problem. I'll say. Um, we, we just to be clear, with the others, uh, this dynamic metric uh, tree embedding uh, applications with, with uh, directions, then, then you're good to go. That's what do you do with directions? Because I mean, there, there, there exists, there's no counterparts to FRT in dynamic settings, right? I mean, you need a tree to change slowly at the issue. But yeah, what, what dynamic? And, I see, I see, I see. Yeah, and the other thing is that I have to analyze it in the context of the IP and outer integration. I remember the current state of the art for that dynamic tree embedding is only only oblique. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the first, so the first uh, across algo one, what it does is to Reduce this problem to a graph with smaller number of vertices. I'll call this vertex reduction. So 
So how, how do we do this? So the algorithm is really simple. The first step, we find the forest. Uh, it's, it's a forest that spans the entire graph. That is the forest whose vertex set is the same as the original graph, but it's not connected. It's not spanning tree. It might be a subgraph. So I found this forest. What do we do next? We solve this star on the contracted graph. Yep. And uh, say, okay, say on this contracted graph, I can solve up to alpha approximation. Then with uh, like a smart way of choosing this forest, what I can do is that this solution on this uh, contracted graph can be mapped back to the original graph and whose quality goes up by a factor of polylog. So when you say G contract F, you mean you take each tree in F and you switch it down to one vertex? Yes, yes. Okay. Exactly. And so then all of the edges are preserved. They all go. Yeah, they're all preserved. So I would just draw one small example here. So I got I'm like one forest, two forests, and three forests here. And there's some like edges uh, outside of the forest. And after contraction, what I have is a triangle here. And in this contracted graph, we also preserve the self loops. That is, if there's a uh, half tree edges that connects like inside one forest, then I'll preserve this self loops here. Okay. And then I solve I self start in this problem. And then it gets, and then it's every cycle in this contracted graph corresponds to a cycle in the original graph, right? And then I will say, okay, this. This thing is like alpha times OKO that one approximation, approximated to the star problem. Yep. So this is algorithm one. And I will just, so I won't tell you, okay. Okay. So I will tell you like how to find this forest and how to do this stuff. So, uh, so how do we find this forest? So we know we can do like random tree sample, right? So what we will do here, we do random forest sample. And we want, and in the tree sampling example, uh, we want like low stretch, right? We want like every edge, it's, it's, less, it's less of the fundamental cycle, it's small, right? compared to its original edge length. In this, in this, uh, in this scenario, one, we want this, almost the same thing. That is, so what we do here is, okay, we find, we, we have a name for it. It's called low stretch decomposition. Low stretch decomposition. And it's short, it's called LSD. And, <laughs> okay, so what's, what's L, what does this algorithm stand for? Okay, so what this algorithm do is that given a size reduction factor k, so what is this k? So I will find in OTO dot m times k time a forest f of m over k components. Why do we? Why do I want like m over k components? That that means that the number of vertices in the G in the contracted graph G over F has only M over K vertices, right? So after doing that, I want that, okay. It's that like, I don't, it's like this F is kind of too constructed and it's, it's kind of drawn from a distribution of forests with probability one path that for every edge, it's, it's stretch that is, or I can say the, the length of the, some kind of forest path is small. Okay. 
the expected value of the first uh, stretch is four kilobytes. It's for if an edge has is like not connected with one of your instances, it is yeah, so I would define like uh, what does this stretch means in this forest case. So in this forest, so uh, suppose I have some edge UV, but U and V might not connect it in this forest. So I'll find the root. So okay, so now all our forests they are rooted forests. Every Components of the forest has a root on it. So say the root, the root of the component containing U is A, the root containing of the components containing V is B. So this stretch is measured as okay, I'll measure the so this corresponds to an A to B pass, right? You from you start from A, take a forest pass, passing through E and goes to B. So this pass is called P. So this pass lives in the original graph G. Then I can measure its length. And then its stretch is simply, so the stretch is defined as the length of this pass P over the length of this edge. Oh, you mean how do I choose the root? Oh, it's that's another story. That's kind of so. Yeah, I'll, I'll, okay. So how do I? So yeah, I just do like two sentences on how this thing is constructed. So we know how to construct a low stretch tree, right? We know how to find such tree. So the thing is, okay, I find a tree. I find a tree, and I cut the tree into like n over k pieces. And then among these n over k pieces, I choose the kind of uh, I choose like one of the vertex as a root. Like I want this this part is kind of technical, so I want to find something that satisfies all these desired qualities. Yeah, and yeah. What's the problem with going all the way? Why do you need to do it? Yeah, so okay, so I'll so using this does not like so this does not give like a okay, I'll say this gives a hint on the data structure, right? So a possible data structure is that if I can maintain this those L this LSD dynamically, then I can then our data structure simply works as okay. I maintain this F, so I maintain this G over F. So every query. I solve this problem on G over F using, using some other algorithm, for example, the tree sampling algorithm. So that gives them like OTL one approximation. And then, and then we know like OTL one approximation on G over F is also like, is still OTL one approximation on the original graph. So that gives, the, gives back the original, uh, a good approximate solution on the original graph. Right? But this is still slow. So we need like, Approximate algorithm number two. Oh, uh, so there's another issue that in this G over F, despite the number of vertices uh, goes down from N to N over K, the number of edges in G over F is still large because we kept everything, like except all those coarse edges. We kept the self loops. So the number of edges. Number of edges is still like order of m. Uh, this is how you pick k or what kind of Yeah, so this k is actually all uh, is actually like arbitrary. But what we do is that we pick k to be um, one over t. So this so t is the uh, the, the level like the recursive level of our data structure, and we pick this t to be like n to small like to sub log m sub log m and and combining with across algorithm number two i can like the whole data structure can be like made like fast enough yeah okay um, t is like square root log n 
This will be the length. Ah, uh, yeah. So uh, between the components, the shortest components, the edge of ATP. Yeah, so, uh, okay. Maybe before talking about it, I'll, I'll answer your question here. So, so why do we want this stretch? So, imagine that. Uh, imagine in our example of like three trees. So, in the contracted graph, it's a triangle here. So we solve the problem on the contracted graph. I and I want to make, I want to uh, project the cycle in the contracted graph back to the original graph. And I want to measure the length of such cycle. So imagine, so in this, in this contracted graph, the edge connecting these two roots that corresponds to uh, a path in the original graph that looks like this. So it's like root to, to the endpoints of this edge, and then goes through this edge, and then go back to the roots. So, so if I want to, so if I want to compute the length of this cycle, the contracted cycle, I have to, for every of these edge, I have to compute its length as the length of this uh, root to vertex, vertex to root paths, right? Yeah. So that's why, so in this case, the, the true, the edge length I put in the contracted graph is simply the original edge length times the stretch. So now I'll talk about like a process algo number two. So a process algo number one is to reduce the number of vertices. So a process algo number two is reduce the number of edges. So, uh, so this algorithm is also, um, I guess, simple in the sense that so in this algorithm number one, we want to find we want to find a contracted graph such that the stretch is small, and in this algorithm number two, I want to find a sparse graph, so such that the stretch is small. What does that mean? So given the G, what I do is to I find a spanner, I find a spanner H which is a subgraph of G. A spanner is a subgraph that kind of to preserve the pairwise distance. So it's like for every pair of UV in G, the distance in H is uh, not much larger than the, its distance in G. In H is not. Okay. So finding this spanner H, so how, so how, the next thing to do is to solve star the mean ratio cycle problem on edge with like alpha approximation approximation and so an intuition tells us that if this edge this banner preserve like the pairwise distance up to a vector of gamma such that gamma is n to the small of one. Then, then the solution on H should be like, it should be like alpha times gamma approx on G. Yeah, but it's actually not true. 
because in edge, some edges are removed. So for, for example, suppose uh, the true solution, so suppose I have a, like some, some graph looks like this, and uh, probably the true solution, the true solution contains this, is this triangle. The true optimal solution is this triangle. But what is R spanner? Probably R spanner looks like this. Then, then we can say, okay, then probably these two edges, are, they're not appear in this banner. So this, and even more in this, in this banner, there's not, there's no even, there's no cycles in it. So yeah, so it just output like zero as a, as the solution. But so what should we do to compensate this situation? Are you gonna figure out create something? Oh, what we're gonna do is, so for this spanner, uh, we actually, so we know, so spanner that preserve pairwise distance. So what it does, so our spanner, we have to find a spanner, we say embedded. What do I mean by embedded? It's like for every edge, UV, in G. So I want to find an embedding called pi sub H of E that is a UV pass in H. There's a UV pass in H and it's short. It's short. Then so so after solving of star solving mean, mean ratio cycle on edge, I have to check. I have to check with all the cycles of the form that is E concatenated with pi H. Yeah, I have to check all those kind of cycles, and then I'll put the best among them. And and yeah, and that should give like alpha times gamma across across. Solution. So I'll just write it here. For, uh, so star is finding, finding the mean ratio cycle. Uh, yeah. But then you will say that you start with the second cycle, then you then you then you So oh, yeah. Yeah, so if the cycle, if the spider, if the cycle, then this output. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so the so remember the problem we want to solve is star on G, and this E concatenated with this embedding path in spanner is a cycle in the original graph G. So, for example, so if so if this if this edge appears in, in a spanner, then a simple like embedding is say, okay, I'll just embed it e into itself. So this corresponds to, uh, so this cycle corresponds to uh, like a tree of like a weird, this kind of, this cycle, this kind of one edge cycle that goes around one edge. Or otherwise, if some if edge is kind of sparsified out from the spanner, then I'll just pick some pass. See? So this might correspond to some pass over here. And then concatenated with this uh, disappeared edge in the spanner. And this whole thing is a cycle in the original graph G. So what we can show is that if, if like none of the cycles in edge is good, then one of this, this kind of spanner cycle is good. Yeah, so yeah, so what do we gain from here? So suppose this, suppose G has like, uh, say N over K vertices. Now, what we can find about what we can do about spanner is that we can find such spanner with 
only sparse in terms that it has only n over k times this gamma, which is as n to a small of what ratio uh, factor edges. So what do we gain from here? So in this algorithm, so across algorithm number one, reduce the number of vertex from n to n over k, but the number of edges is still high, m. So using this approximate algorithm number two, edge reduction, the number, I apply this edge reduction to this g over l. After doing this, the graph has only, has only like n over k vertices and n over k times n to the small one edges. Then what do we do? How do we do to solve problems on edge? We do this thing again. We do this vertex reduction and then edge reduction again. And we do this like for like D levels until we are reach to a graph with so few vertices, say one vertices, then we are done. So, and then like, like so we have this kind of a recursive approximate, approximate algorithm for the mean ratio cycle. So our data structure, what our data structures do is to dynamize, to make that procedure like dynamic. To, to make it like support our gradient less updates. So sorry, why can you use like uh, algorithm like uh, vertex and edge reduction? Okay, yeah, yeah, it's kind of like algorithm. Oh, or, 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 or why, where, where does this like, where do you use like the alternate? Yeah, so the reason that to be alternate is that vertex reduction, uh, so, one way is that I want to keep things simple. So one, one algorithm only do one thing. So in the reduction, we do this low stretch decomposition to find force, and we consider the contracted graph. But we don't have like we don't have uh, any guarantees on the number of edges in the contracted graph. So we have to 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 compensate this. We have to uh, deal with this. So the way we deal with this, this is that. Okay, we use this algo number two edge reduction to reduce the number of edges. Uh, maybe can I say one thing? So historically, this is the way that Schema and Tim developed their Laplacian solver. They have one phase, which is the vertex reduction phase, where they say I reduce the m over k vertices and I lose an approximation factor of k. And then their second phase, they build a spectral sparsifier that reduces to a sparse band. So this is like the same general structure that like Schema and Tim had for Laplacian. Yeah, and, and then. Uh... I'm so confused about. I, I guess uh, this is the, for, the, for the running time. You, you can find like you use the number of vertices all, all at once. Oh, uh, that yeah. It, it's important to yeah. It comes in in how you like make it dynamic. Okay, so, but but for I mean, if you do something like non right? like this order m k or up to m times k, you want k to be not so large. Oh yeah, it depends on how you construct it. Yeah, depends on you construct. So okay. uh, maybe maybe uh, 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 just, I'm, I'm just uh, yeah it's yeah I I don't, I don't know if this is gonna be useful at all but like I, I don't think I, I I personally don't have all that stored yeah maybe yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so yeah. So I will just like combine these two algorithms and write like like uh, a combined like pseudo code here. So what do we do from one last thing? So the first thing is that the first step we sample LSD, we call that, which is a forest. Then compute banner. Scanner of uh, H, which is a subgraph of G over L. So this H has N over K vertices, N over K, 
and the small one edges. So this edge is actually the size is reduced. So install star the mean ratio cycle problem on edge. Install this on edge and this. And then we compare the solution of this edge uh, and uh, compare with the best spanner cycle, which is all those uh, edges that does not appear in edge con concatenated by its path in a spanner, the short path in the spanner. Boss in that edge. So if this, so if our, uh, we can recursively solve in edge with like alpha approximation up to alpha approximate, then this whole thing gives. <laughs> Okay. You do move the chair, just move the chair. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Then this whole thing gives like alpha times n to the small of one. This n to the small of one is independent of this k, the size reduction factor of dots. So this is the picture of the entire algorithm. And yeah, so it's all. So we want to uh, make this same dynamic. This is the uh, approximation through the easy. So, uh, so this, so we have two components. So let's discuss like how do we make this LSD dynamic. So now we have one LSD, which is a forest, which can be viewed as a, more, a collection of trees, rooted trees, such that uh, the stretch of every edge is small. And this stretch is defined using a forest path. Right. So now let's uh, consider only the case we have like edge insertions and deletions. We don't like or because for like gradient or less updates, all we can do is just remove the original edge and insert a new one with the updated gradient or less. Right. Now how do we do this? Uh, a very simple way to do this is say okay, suppose I want to update. Edge UV. And after doing this, I want the stretch to be small. How do we do this? We just make U V as root. So, so let's say that this, this is U, this is B, and then, and then we're done. Why we are done? Because so now consider an edge U V with both ends are a root of this collection of forest. Then its stretch is actually one because its forest path is only the edge itself. So the stretch is one. So is how we so if both UV are root of the force we have, we are done. But 
but this is just two good literature. So what we usually have is that both UV are not roots. So how do we do? So and this how do we do this? Okay. So I will discuss like how do we do to add one to mark one uh vertex U as group. So suppose U lives in this components with group A. So we know that one 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 tree cannot have two roots. So how do you do? We just play the tree in the cube. We find a path, we find an edge along this A A to U path, tree path. We find one, we find one edge, we delete at that edge from the forest, and we mark this U as a so after removing this edge E, the whole tree is decomposed into two, two components. So the new component, new component does not have a root here. So we just say, okay, U is the root. U is the root. So, and yeah, it's, and that's, so the problem boils down to like, how do we pick this D? And how do we make sure, make sure that, okay, all the edges uh, with end points is in the new components, their stretch is still fine. So this is, uh, I won't go go this down to like detail, but it's but this whole uh, analysis is it appears in 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 the literature regarding this J tree construction from like two thousand and ten by Margaret. And in J tree, they consider like they does not consider like stretch. They consider like uh, something else because they want to do like cut preserving stuff. But similar analysis shows that okay, this also works. And this has been like used in some other dynamic data structure as well. Like some paper in 2020 says that okay, we can use this to do like um uh, OTO1 dynamic MPS, which is like entry two thirds copy. So this is appearing in the uh, literature. So yeah. So this is how the LSD part got, got, got made into dynamic. So it's up in the edge, I just mark both, both endpoints as root. So by marking one vertex as root, I have to uh, split some tree into two so that this new root has its own tree to, to be a root. So this is the dynamic LSD. Question: The edge E that you just uh, cut out. Why? Why is it stretch not the uh, massive right now? Oh, uh, it's pardon. So you, you just picked a random edge on the path from A to U. Oh yeah. Uh, it's actually not right now. I have to pick. Whatever um, you picked, you picked some edge, right? Some so edge. This from A to U is a bit large. Why does this? You have to not give a bad stretch for you. Yeah. So I have to pick like. Uh, I have to pick E to be like something that is. Um, uh, with small, like small congestion. There's another top notation called congestion, and it's kind of going. The answer is careful. <laughs> yeah, you just care for the dudes. Careful. The is careful. Careful. <laughs> and you, you mean this? You mean this? Uh, the remove tree edge E has now has a large stress, right? Yeah. And what I want to say is that you won't because we're doing so careful that it won't. <laughs> so, 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 so the problem is if you change the root A in the old tree, or if you keep the root A. Uh, I, like in the old tree, the root is still A, it's still over next step. Yeah, I see that by spelling, you hear some trees like coming on there. Uh, it's, you just do some like heavy light decomposition like it yeah. just it's just something like that just yeah, a bunch of heavy light decomposition yeah, it's, yeah. so it just true stuff yeah, yeah it's, actually what, what we found is that you can construct an upper bound on this stretch and say this stretch is not um goes off and it's, it's like, uh maybe um, it'll be and we can talk about it later. Yeah. So how much time do I have? Ten minutes.
<laughs> okay, so now I have to take, talk about this second part. So the second part is to uh, make this better dynamic under uh, all the edge updates happens by here. So all the updates we have. So we know. So this. So this dynamic spanner. I want is that I want to make this spanner on the block of this form. G contracted by some forest F. But what's the uh, updates to this object? So the first thing is edge updates in G. The second thing is edge re removal. Edge removal from F. So you remove you remove one edge for this F. What does this correspond? It, it's kind of to split some vertex in this G over F into two. So it's actually so we call this uh, operation called vertex split. So I want to uh, build a data structure for dynamic spanner that supports these two objects, two updates, why edge updates in G over F, that is an effort, and then this there's this vertex split operation. So uh, how do we do this? So let me just write a uh, a simpler version for, for this problem. So, what we can show is that if this G over F has max degree, has max degree, delta, then both of this operation can be supported in time of time delta times n plus small. And and then and the magic thing is that in this G in the spanner G over F of G over F per operation only small number of edges done and only small number of edge, edge changes. This is uh, the goal we have here, and uh, I just. So, so how do we do this? And also, we want to like to uh, build like an embedding of edge into the standard. So, what do we do? So, we have by all these um uh, uh, task literatures in like graph algorithms. We know how to statically we have static construction of such. Uh, standard for every and I can for every I can find the path in, in the standard. We have so we have steady construction. So how do we dynamic? So how do we make this dynamic? So the way so yeah so so given an up, edge of base. So some edge update happens at some like endpoints. So a nice way is to rebuild the entire spanner, right? So just run it again and this spends a, a ton of time. But another thing is that okay, suppose at least two vertex that got whose endpoints got updated, and uh, we know that for many other edges, 
their embedding does not use this edge, does not use the edge that just got removed or got inserted. So I can divide a graph. So given an edge update, I can divide a graph into two. So one part is that, so I say I want to update some edge B. So far, so the first part is that contains all the edges, all the edges is called on F. And all this and their embedding contains this um, updated edge E. And the second part is the rest, that is edges whose embedding does not involve this edge E. So how do we do this? So we just say, okay. The naive way is that, okay, we preserve the part here and we compute a spanner on this smaller graph. So that seems correct, right? Because um, all this, um, all this, um, because all the edges, now they have, so this, the spanner property is um, verified or witnessed by the embedding, pi of E. And all the edges in the second part, their embedding are still valid in the new spanner. And then for edges in the first part, their embedding are computed like uh, from scratch. So it's good. So but this, but this construction is still like slow. So, so how do we do this? So we just do kind of a Layer thing that okay. So uh, we just do some kind of the blocking stuff on the edges so that okay we have because after one edge updates or one vertex splits, there may be like many edges who involved in this new vertex. So after doing this plugin stuff, I can show that okay, all, every time I can maintain like a layer of uh, set of vertices, we just just so sorry, sorry. And yeah, so Yeah, you, you do the other thing and we can show that okay it's like we can do this delta n over one to the all that. So sorry I, I didn't prepare how to present this part particularly. So and uh yeah so we combine these two uh, algorithms, these two data structures. We can maintain this on. Uh, we can maintain this approximation thing, and by like by doing the following thing. So in this uh, LSD stuff, so every every edge updates one edge updates. Uh, that creates like uh, all like constant number of edge. Edge updates in G over F and all of one vertex splits in G over F. And, and every of these splits are handled by the dynamic spanner data structure that corresponds to n to the small of one edge updates in this spanner edge of G over F.
and then I can just. But the thing is that this every of this are kind of increasing number of vertices in G over F by one. So, so how do we uh, how do we deal with this? So probably over like so many rounds, the number of vertices in G over F is so large that that we cannot deal with this. Like we cannot have we, can, we cannot deal 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 with this equation. So we just rebuild, rebuild the whole, resemble the whole LSD and rebuild the whole data structure after n over k on uh, edge updates to g. And then because and then we have and then after doing this, uh, so I'm gonna finish about the part here. So one edge updates correspond to constant number of vertex splits and one edge updates in G over F drop. And by the spanner property, the spanner G edge of G over F has there's like n to the small of one updates. In H. So, so if I have like D levels of this, or uh, D level of this stuff, then in in the on uh, the bottom level, the number of updates I have to deal with is like n to the small of one to the k. But however, this n to the small of one factor. Which happens in this standard does not is independent of the this k we choose here. So this whole thing can be still always can be still to be choose to be like only n to small of one of this. So it's like in every level of the data structure, we only have to deal with like n to the small of one up, updates, and each updates. Of this both of these data structure dealt in like in the time that like is roughly poly k. So by balancing out this k and the so this uh n small right here is the d factor in the exponent and this d and then this poly k I can pick k so that this whole thing balanced out into n to the small one. And this is how the whole data structure works against a previous adversary. Yep. And uh, I guess the time's up. Yeah. Well, I guess, I mean, I think it's a bit past what people would be to read, but obviously we're happy to take as many questions as that's your honor. Sure. So I guess the most obvious question. Uh, so how slowly or quickly the k is the function given by two over one? Uh it was written somewhere earlier. Oh it's oh now it's over here. Oh it's not like so the factor is in the standard that angle one is standard. Yeah, so it's like standard that angle is standard. Two, three, three over four. I guess they're doing something like that. Yeah, so it's still like endless small. Yeah, and this thing, yeah, and, we, and we just multiply this by D and we put it into like not to the one end. So this thing, no, it's three over so zero four becomes seven over. I see. Yeah. The whole thing is like, that's bad. It doesn't prevent the other. So that, that's not so bad. So, no, so, like, like, so uh, this is like, like a practical like, algorithm for something like, large. Like, 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 uh, I don't know whether it's a general combination. Like, this is also two to the last of random. If you put S to be like a generalization, a million, this thing will be like, yeah, it's like 12 or something. Yeah, it's like. And for graph of like a million edges, there's the current like 
software packages as you know, like efficient support is passive. Oh, I see. Okay, so the crossover point is this. Um, and like, the, like, oh, we're gonna do a bound. Actually, I don't know what. Like, there's a bound. There's a bound. I'm not sure there's so many, like, yeah, well, I mean, I don't think, but even there's constant here in this part of the right. it's not actually here. Gotcha. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Interesting. Sure. Okay. Sure. Okay. 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 Oh, I guess the question is. Oh, 